Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody this evening uh, to munch on this. This is our second week in the series. And then um, last week we had Jerry Doan on. That video has been uh, posted to our YouTube channel and it's also on our Facebook page. And then um, tonight we have John Abizade with uh, the Vents uh, Virtual Fencing Company. And uh, next week uh, is Jay Fear talking about carbon. Um, so be looking for that one uh, next Thursday. Uh, let's see, the sessions are all being recorded. Uh, so tonight I will, uh, I'm recording this one and then I'll get that posted as well to our YouTube and Facebook pages. Um, some other upcoming events to put on your calendars that we know of at this point. Uh, the summer tour <clears throat> is being hosted by Donnie and myself here at our place um, in Beach. Uh, that'll be on June 21st. And then the Leopold tour will be held at Lance and Anissa Gartner's ranch south of Glen Ellen on July 18th. We would like you to, or we'd like to encourage everybody, if you aren't a current member of the Grazing Lands Coalition, to go to our website and become a member. The, um, the, uh, the Grazing Lands Coalition has about 33 mentors right now across the state of North Dakota that are available uh, to reach out to you as ranchers to uh, just toss around ideas, answer questions, anything like that. And myself, I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm Trish Faring, the field representative for the Grazing Lands Coalition. Uh, my husband and I ranch about 12 miles north of Beach on the Montana North Dakota border. Uh, we have two daughters uh, here on the ranch with us. And uh, I've been working for the Grazing Lands Coalition for about four years now. My job responsibilities are working with producers uh, to develop grazing systems. I also try to uh, work with our mentor program and act as a liaison between our mentors and any producers that are interested in uh, visiting with mentors, as well as working with our partners, which I see we have a few on this evening, to find uh, some cost share options for producers that are looking for fencing projects, water developments, uh, anything to do with grazing systems, cover crops, and uh, anything like that. So uh, without further ado, I am going to go ahead um, and welcome John. Uh, John Abizade is coming to us from Colorado this evening. And I'll turn it over to you, John, and let you get started. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. My name is John, based in Denver. I work for Vents. We're a virtual fencing company. I'll bring you guys through like a high level overview of my standard presentation I give pretty often about how the technology works, some of the ROI components that we think about, a little bit about what we've been up to the past couple of years and then what we're going to continue to work on in the future. So feel free to, I'll, I'll just run through everything and then usually we open it up to questions afterwards and usually there's, there's quite a few. So I'll leave plenty of room for that. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Present. All right. Does that look good? Awesome. Thank you. So essentially what we do at a very high level is put collars like these on cows and use sound and shock stimulus to influence where the animals spend their time in the landscape. This picture is up at Thunder Basin in Wyoming, actually, in the National Grassland. Pretty cool. I was up there last summer. There's three main components to the vent system. The first is gonna be the collar that goes on animal. The second is gonna be a base station, which we use to create a network across the ranch that the collars communicate through. And the third is the herd manager software that the producer or land manager would log into on their desktop computer. That's where you build your virtual fence lines and analyze any of the data that the collars are collecting. The caller here, if you guys can still see me on the screen, this is version 2.5-ish, I would say. Weighs about two and a half pounds. There's a plastic casing. There's a positive chain and there's a negative chain. At the top is going to be two links. The chains simply double back through these links. It's adjustable for size. So usually you have one side preset and you loop it around, size the other chain. And then we attach with a metal zip tie right now. Quick and easy to put on, quick and easy to remove. Retention is going to really good with those. 
There's two D rings on the back of the collar here. Those will split out at about 650 pounds of force in case an animal gets hung up on a tipo, tree, tree, anything like that. Inside the collar, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on from an electronic perspective, but the most important components are gonna be a radio chip, which communicates back and forth with the base station. So that's how we get data in and out of the collar, and that's predominantly location data and then new instructions for virtual fence lines. And then there's a GPS chip inside the collar as well. And that's listening to the satellites to fix the caller's location. It's not going to be sending information back and forth from the satellite. It's just going to be listening so the caller knows where it's at. There's also two screws. These will pop out. Faceplate comes off. There's a big O-ring there. And inside is a battery. Looks a lot like a D-cell battery. It's purple, made by a company called Tadirin out of Israel. It's a special energy-dense lithium-type battery. Uh, we looked at the solar panels, we looked at the rechargeables, we think those are expensive, they get dirty, they break, and there's really limited efficacy in how much those solar panels are charging on collars, because they're not typically riding at the top of the animal's neck. And then additionally, with a rechargeable battery, the hot and the cold can drain it quickly, just like if you leave your phone on the dash of your car during a really hot day. So this energy dense battery is designed to prevent that, and it can handle the hot and the cold. You're managing really tight, moving animals often, three to six months battery life, standard cow-calf operation, and most of the folks that we're seeing in, in America, on the Western United States, six to nine months as a general rule of thumb for the battery life. So it gets you through a, a seasonal grazing season here in Colorado. And then if you just wanna track animals only, it's like some of the folks in Australia do, this battery can last up to two years. So wide range of battery life, it all depends on what you're asking of the caller. At a very high level, it's a sound and sound plus shock collar. On the screen here, the two blues you can ignore, those are just ways to visualize the paddock, but the red and the white line here is what a virtual fence line looks like in the computer. It's more of a pressure zone, rather than a hard line in the sand where you're in and you're out, we think of it as a, a zone of pressure. So the white strip here is gonna be our sound zone, that's a standard setting 15 yard wide. And then the red is gonna be the sound plus shock zone. And that as a standard setting is 75 yards wide. What it looks like is an animal moves into the sound zone, they get a beep, tells them to turn around and return to the herd. If they continue into the sound plus shock zone, they get a beep plus a shock. And the profile on the shock looks like a half second beep, half second nothing, half second shock, four and a half seconds, nothing. We cycle through a few times, and then there are timeouts again for animal health safety in case they get confused, bogged down, anything like that. This is set up as a one-way gate with passive recapture is what we call it. What that means is if you're keeping animals on the right-hand side here in an enclosure, they're gonna get pressure on the way out. So following my mouse, sound and shock. But if they busted through, maybe a calf pulled them out or something like that, they are on the other side of the pressure zone, no stimulus there. But if they want to turn around and go back to water or go back to the herd, they can actually move back into this enclosure. They're not going to get any sound or any shock, so no pressure on the way back in. But as soon as they're back inside that enclosure, the virtual fence line will turn back on and they'll be passively recaptured. It's good design for standard virtual fencing, and then it also allows you to do all sorts of interesting stuff from a rotational grazing perspective with ladder grazes, step grazes, wheel grazes, that sort of thing, and just passively allowing the animals to be drawn over onto the new pasture with feed pressure and then having that gate turn on behind them so they're captured in the new paddock. The very high level overview of how the collar works there. Uh, we also have exclusion zones, I should mention actually which is the opposite of an inclusion zone. And folks will use those to protect riparian areas and they'll use them to protect burn areas and things of that nature. Next component is the base station. This is really fundamental piece and what allows the collar to do what it needs to do. It's a light footprint hardware we put out on the ranch, about three foot by four foot. We put some posts in the ground, T-posts or the concrete rebar stakes that are about 36 inches long. Those are the ones I like. Make sure this thing doesn't fly away in the wind. 
And then we raise the mast if it's kind of flat or rolling flat. And then there's three more anchor points for the guy wire to come off that. Two folks can really pick this up out of the back of a pickup truck before the batteries are inside. So it's a pretty, pretty light footprint and they're designed to be installed and, and left and not moved. And you kind of just forget about them and they run and do their thing. There's three main components to the base station. The first is going to be this skinny white antenna up at the top. That's what's called a LoRaWAN antenna, long range wide area network, the type of radio technology that we use to get the data in and out of the collar. It's low power, it's low data, and it creates a network across the ranch that the callers communicate through. Next one down is going to be this trapezoid looking white antenna. That is what's called our cellular backhaul. We use either Verizon or AT&T to bridge what's going on with the callers and the internet and your ability to access it through the herd manager software and your computer. The callers themselves do not need cell coverage. Those are totally independent. We don't by any means need cell coverage across the ranch, but we do need it specifically where that base station goes. And generally we're putting them up at the high points here in Colorado, it's up on top of mountains and in the plains, it's up on top of the high point, maybe hills or buttes on the ranch. So generally that's where the cell coverage is, even in, in tricky cell coverage situations. And we've been in some pretty remote places and knock on wood so far in the States, the cell backhaul has worked well for us. It's cheap, it's reliable, it does a good job. Last component is the power system. There's a solar panel and four batteries inside. This will run without sunlight for five days if it's a particularly bad storm. And even if it goes down, it would just kick back on. We monitor these remotely 24 seven so we can tell you if there's a change in the power system or if there's a change in the cell signal strength or quality, we can alert you. And we've had these up on the Montana border <laughs> when it gets negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. And they've been chugging for the past five years. So they're pretty tough. And they've been up on top of mountains in Colorado during 100 mile per hour windstorms too. So they do a really good job. The golden question is going to be how many acres does it cover? And the answer is it entirely depends on topography. So what we do here is called an RF plan. Take an outline of the ranch, basically just the boundary of the, showing us where you want coverage and where you're going to be putting animals. And then we fly around on Google Earth, we check up topography, look at all the high points, think about, can we access that site? Do we have cell coverage at that site? Will this base station site be putting coverage in the areas that we need it? Those are the main questions we like to talk about when doing our RF plan. And then we take those individual site locations, we run it through a tool called Cloud RF, which is our modeling tool, and it spits out the projected coverage based on those particular site locations. The green is exactly what we want to see. That's the good coverage in the model. The blue is where things start to trail off a little bit, but still functional coverage. And then you'll notice there's going to be dead zones that just look like plain old Google Earth. And we have those across every ranch that we work with. Just the nature of the topography in the American West, you're never going to have perfect coverage. So the way that the system is designed, if you wanted to run a virtual fence line, you know, north to south through here, through the green zone, through the dead zone, you can still do that. As long as you download the information into the caller for the virtual fence line, it gives you the thumbs up, says, hey, I'm good to go. It's going to be able to go down into those areas where you don't have coverage and you'll still get your sound and you'll still get your shock just like you're supposed to. Because that caller has the virtual fence line downloaded into its memory and it's listening to the satellite to fix its location so it can still do its work. Only thing we're not going to get is the location data and then the ability to make a change to that virtual fence line. So that caller is still sending out those location data points every 30 minutes as a standard setting. It's just whether or not we have a base station there to receive those. And then if we don't have connection to that caller to receive that information, therefore we can't send new instructions to it. So we can work on kind of both ends of the spectrum in terms of coverage. On the first end is gonna be someone who's looking to move cows often, they want lots of data, and they want an adaptive system, meaning they can make changes when they want to, and they can make them quickly. In that situation, we want to put up a strong network with the right number of base stations and cover as much of the ranch as possible and have a lot of overlapping coverage from multiple base stations. On the other side of the spectrum is maybe someone on a BLM permit that's 70,000 acres. They see their cows once every nine months, and they're going to put a perimeter fence out there, and they're going to 
leave it up static the whole season, not make any changes to the caller, and they're not so interested in the data. In that situation, we can get away with less base stations, a less robust network, but we're going to sacrifice location data, and then we're going to sacrifice the ability to make changes quickly and easily to those callers. So two different use cases. I like to err on the, the side where we have more coverage and just leads to a better product experience. And what's unique about the Vents tool is being able to adaptively manage based on what you're seeing on the ground and make those changes quickly. And you lose some of that when you don't have base station coverage. But for some of the folks that we work with, you know, that far end of the spectrum works for them just fine too. This RF plan that we're looking at here is about 35,000 acres. It's a forest service allotment outside of Carbondale, Colorado. They have good coverage out here and really rough terrain, very mountainous. There's ski resorts up here, and that's with five base stations. <laughs> and I would say the standard project, you know, for a private producer is two to three, typically for anywhere from 12,000 to 35,000 acres. But again, it all depends on topography. <laughs> so we'll do a plan for each one of these customers that we have. Last component is the herd manager software. This is what you log into on your desktop computer. You build your virtual fence lines. You're able to associate the individual ear tag IDs on the animal with the collar ID. So you can manage in the software down to the individual animal. You'll get all sorts of alerts for battery life, things like that. This is a better view of what it actually looks like. The different colors on the left-hand side of the screen those are just ways to visualize your pastures and paddocks. You can put in gates, water sources. They don't make a change to the virtual fencing. It's just so when you're looking at the software, you can understand what you're actually looking at. There's also the cow icons on there. You can change those to different icons. They're your location data points. And you can also change them to be different colors to mean different things. For example, does this caller have the most recent update that I sent it? Or is this location data point 30 minutes old, or is it 12 hours old in the stay out location? Different ways to visualize the data and what's going on in the system. And then on the right hand side is what's called a heat map. This is pretty cool. You can, as long as you have good coverage, you can take back a look at a couple of weeks of grazing data for an individual caller or for the whole herd. And it'll play across the screen like a radar map. And it'll show you where you're putting pressure on the landscape and where the animals are not. Examples of how folks have used that as they said, hey, my animals aren't up in the northeast corner of the pasture and we're underutilizing forage up there. So we should virtually fence them in and make sure we're getting closer to 100% utilization. Another way that folks have used it is out on a forest service permit. The range con thought the producer was really hammering this riparian area and spending too much time in there. And the producer thought they were spending a lot less time <laughs> than the range con did. So he took the location data from the callers, he brought it to her and said, hey, here's the data to prove that I'm barely in this riparian area. Like I'm really not beating it up. I should be able to put more cows out here. So they were able to use that data to put 20 more cows out on the permit. So that was his ROI for the callers there. This is where we're at in North America. You can see we're predominantly American West. It's kind of an older slide. So there's more points out here, certainly. And We've got more like 35,000 callers in the field right now, but the red dots are going to be just universities that are using our product and partnerships. And then the blue dots predominantly are private producers, forest service projects, that type of thing. You can see we're generally the American West or a rangeland management tool. When we get down really tight to, you know, five, 10, 20 acres, and we're trying to manage that tight paddocks, the system can't really handle that right now in terms of GPS accuracy and their learning curve for the animals or learning curve for the producers. So our customer success folks, who are the ones that will teach you how to use the system and the callers and the software, they'll tell you first year out of the gate when everyone's learning, pretty, pretty safe bet to manage down to about a hundred acre paddocks at the tightest. You don't want to go too much, too much tighter than that the first year. Though as those animals start to understand the system and as the producers start to understand what works well with their specific topography and specifically what's going on in their operation, then you can get a little tighter, but it's generally recommended about 100 acres first year. So that's why we're American West. We built it as a rangeland management tool. We're not really a fit for the East Coast stuff there. The productivity of the land is much higher and they have much higher stocking density on much smaller acreage. 
As far as history events, we were founded in 2016, had a running pilot program for about three or four years. One was in Montana, another in Oklahoma, another near the engineering office in California. And then the very beginning of last year, maybe a little bit before that, we became commercially available for the first time. So we went from a couple thousand, maybe even less than that thousand something units in the field to 35,000 units right now, at least, uh, maybe more than that. So we've grown quite a bit over the past year and a half. It's been really exciting. And we were also purchased by Merck Animal Health. We were a startup. We were going to raise money for our Series B round, fundraising round last fall. Uh, Merck Animal Health was actually a minority investor in the company, and they were going to lead the fundraising round. And they saw an opportunity to purchase us outright. So we are now rolling into the overall Merck Animal Health superstructure over the next couple of years. But we're still doing business as usual, hiring more people, selling more collars, working on the product. So it's been exciting for us. We've got a, a nice boost in R&D spending, and we've got a lot more business operations kind of uh, juice behind us, which is nice. As far as pricing goes, pretty simple model right now. The base stations are your fixed infrastructure. You purchase it, you own it. There's no recurring fees. $10,000 for a self-install, which the majority of our private producers will do. It's $12,500 for events-assisted install, meaning you still build the hut up like an IKEA project, but we'll send someone out from our team and they'll help you get it deployed in the field, hook up all the electronics, make sure everything's working properly. Majority of Forest Service, BLM, or NGO projects like the Nature Conservancy will, will opt to have us come out and install. Callers themselves are on a subscription model. That subscription includes all the software, it includes all the customer support, and it includes a working caller. So if you had an electrical failure or you had a mechanical failure for some reason on the caller, you would be able to get a new one and send it to you, and there'd be no charge or fee associated with that, which is nice. And then the batteries themselves are just 10 bucks a pop. You purchase those as needed. Majority of producers that are grazing seasonally are going to be one battery per year. So call it 50 bucks per collar per year. And then the folks we work with that are grazing in the winter are looking at two batteries per year. So call it $60 per collar. And as, as far as ROI goes, return on investment in the collars, the original idea at the inception of the company was you're going to rotationally graze, you're going to increase quality and quantity of forage, you're going to increase stocking density, and that's going to pay for the collars. And we still believe that to be true. We're going to work out some case studies and do some things over the next couple of years to prove that out with some data. But there's also a whole bunch of other ROIs that we've come across over the past year that have been really exciting for us to see. You can read some of them on the right-hand side, but the big one, of course, is going to be fencing costs. Here in Colorado, it can be outrageous when you're talking about labor and fencing, especially in forest service type terrain where it's mountainous. We've heard up to $30,000 per mile uh, for interior fencing and perimeter fencing, which is was very expensive, particularly when you think about the fact that you could have a couple extra trespasses on your permit, and then you could lose that permit the next year, right? It's really hard to sink that much infrastructure into, into a permit, whereas if you can deploy a base station and have some callers, you can take those with you whenever you need to move into the next place that you're going to graze, which is nice. We've also run into a lot of folks that have been happy about reducing their gather times with location data. You can ride for three weeks instead of six weeks, then that could be a huge savings in time in terms of time and both labor. So that could be really valuable for folks. And then there's also ROIs that are a little bit harder to put a quantitative number on. Typically, they're involving multiple stakeholders in wildlife. For example, up in Northwest Colorado, the Camblin family, they run on a piece of ground called the Bitterbrush, about 10, 15,000 acres, something like that. Colorado Parks and Wildlife actually owns it now. The Camblins owned it in the 90s, but they had to sell it in the early 90s to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and they just got the permit to graze it again a couple of years ago. So they're super excited, but Camblins are pretty progressive. They move cows often. They rotationally graze soil health minded folks. And CPW does not want them to put any physical infrastructure out because there's a lot of pronghorn and there's a lot of sage grouse. So no hot wire, no more physical fencing or infrastructure. So what they did was Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Camblins got together, purchased a couple of base stations and collars. And now Dana is able to manage the way that she wants to and rotationally graze on the bitter brush 
And CPW is really happy because they're getting the good grazing pressure and there's no physical infrastructure for the wildlife. So a little bit harder to put a quantitative ROI on that, but there's multiple stakeholders and they're both certainly getting value out of the collars. So we see that a lot with forest service projects and projects with the Nature Conservancy. And <laughs> You still there, John? For some reason, your your voice is. Not coming through. And it's really like a catch about a part of a word every so often. Oh, are you back? Uh, one sec, I'm gonna change this. Okay. I thought for a second it was my internet going down because it did that earlier today. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you fine. Yep. All right. Sorry about that. I've got a new speaker uh, and sometimes it cuts out. So can you see my screen again? Yep, we're good. All right. Awesome. So I think last thing I mentioned was we got some callers on bison and sheep. I'm not going to be commercially available by any means over the next couple of years, but it's kind of exciting to see how that goes. It's a couple of specific trials. And then we've got continued work on the caller that's going to happen, you know, the duration of the entire company. And the long-term vision is really to have animal health metrics come along with the virtual fencing, heat detection, calving alerts, that type of thing. It's not going to happen in the next couple of years, but that's certainly the, the long-term direction of the company and, and where we want to go and what we're going to be working on after we finish our blocking and tackling, which is good retention, good virtual fencing, good software. So that'll be the next couple of years focused on and then long-term certainly looking to do some more of those animal health metrics. A little bit more short-term, we're going to put an RFID tag in the collar. And if in the future, instead of having to write down the ID on the ear tag and then the ID in the collar and type it manually into the software, you'll be able to just wand those two together when you have the RFID tag from Allflex and it'll automatically pair them in the software, which would be nice. And some of these collars actually come back really beat up from the field and the number that's on them can get worn off. So additional benefit is you'll just be able to tap that collar and know which one it is, which will be a nice feature as well. Um, that's a very high level overview of the collars huh? and the software. Happy to open it up to any questions. Uh, John, this is Jay Reiser and um, you had, uh, your speaker had quit before you started talking about the carbon revenues. Um, oh, yeah. Essentially, we had, uh, you had talked about US and Australian expansion and had just flipped the screen before uh, before we lost you. Sorry about that. So I'll no go back worries. to the carbon projects. And oh, we have a, a pilot program right now with maybe 10 or 12 ranches in it. It's probably going to get spun out from like our side of the business and we'll simply use the collar and the data as a verification tool for grazing practices to help with carbon credits and carbon sequestration. So ideally, those folks can use it as a value add when they go out to sell those credits. And again, that's probably going to get spun out pretty soon here, but we certainly have a pilot program going, which is exciting and an interesting use case for the, the data on the collars. So thank you for mentioning that I missed that or my, my speaker cut out there. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Anybody is welcome to unmute themselves, turn your video back on if you'd like to ask questions. So, um, 
John, a question I'd have for you with these base stations that you got. Um, I know a lot of the individuals up in up in this area are going to have fragmented grazing where they'll have, say, a section in one area, they'll have another section 10 miles away, they might have another section, another 10 miles in the other direction, just say it makes a triangle or something like that. Um, would you be able to pick up and move that base station if you were to choose to move the cattle from one, I'm gonna use the term grazing allotment to another? Yeah, gr great question. So we experimented with that over the past year and we, we've learned a few lessons. There are certain situations where like a mobile base station can make a lot of sense. That's if you're grazing pivots and it's pretty smooth farm roads and it's really easy access. Additionally, we have a lot of projects where there's a forest service group that's leading the project and then there's six to 10 different producers and they all train their animals at their home ranch before they go up on the mountain where the network is. And in those situations, a mobile base station to go train here for a week, train here for a week can work really well. When we start talking about moving base stations, like follow animals is like your primary point of coverage. Uh, one is the base station is not designed to be moved and there's sensitive electronics in there. So if it breaks while in transit, then you can get stuck with the instructions that are in the collar without the ability to change them. And then that be can become a, kind of a crisis pretty quickly, right? If the animals are running out of feed or running out of water, you need to move them and you don't have the ability to do so. So that's one of the reasons that we don't really like moving base stations unless we have to. Um, second is we monitor those locations remotely. So we can tell you if there's any change to the base station power or cell coverage, that type of thing. And when they get moved around, it, it messes with that ability to, to monitor them. And then third is a lot of the times the folks that we've tried this with end up, one, just not moving the base station when they need to, or two, they move it to a place where it doesn't have cell coverage or it's not an ideal spot for the base station. So it doesn't provide good coverage for the callers because we've got to be really specific about where those base stations go. And then lastly, you really want overlapping coverage with multiple base stations. It's like having more bars on your cell phone. The engineers will tell you that you should be able, or a caller should be able to communicate with two and a half base stations at any given time. We don't really hit that in the field, but it's something to strive for. So that overlapping coverage just leads to a better user experience in the software. So when it comes to really fragmented landscapes and, and, and owner, ownership, we don't have a great answer for that yet. I think what we're really good at right now is, you know, contiguous acreage ranches. That's kind of where we shine. And that's where the, the base stations make the most sense. We haven't quite figured out as a company how we're going to work on those fragmented sort of stuff that's really spread out. And you're only three weeks here, three weeks there, three weeks there. That's a little tougher for us from a coverage perspective. We may end up in the future have having a mobile base station that's like a designed unit that's a, that's specifically for that type of operation. I can certainly see that happening. Uh, and then we've also done what's called nomadic base stations. So they're moving from known location to known location. So if you're in area A for three months and then you're in area B for three months, then moving two base stations from spot one and two to spot two and three a little bit more manageable and makes more sense for following the animals uh, with like week long intervals. So kind of long winded answer to that, but it really depends on the situation. <laughs> the, the best, the best use case is, is contiguous acreage with uh, a permanent network. And then we, we work in situations around that certainly. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there was someone else that was wanting to ask a question maybe about the same time. Pete, did you unmute yourself maybe? Yeah, I did. No, uh, two questions. What, is there a minimum number of base stations? And uh, is the life expectancy on those batteries, is that just due to the, um, the guys that uh, have tighter groupings of critters? They just spend more time getting feedback from the, the virtual fence itself? Two great questions. I'll, I'll answer that second one first. So the way that the collar works is, let's say you've got a big 3,000 acre pasture or something like that, right? Something big. Animals smack dab in the middle. We generally know how quickly a cow moves. We have some algorithms to determine what direction. 
So in order to save battery, we take a GPS pin every 30 minutes. So when you're taking a GPS pin every 30 minutes, you know, the accuracy may be 100 feet this way or that way in a rangeland management situation, that's no problem. As you move closer to a virtual fence line, within 1,000 feet, we start taking a GPS pin every 10 seconds. And then within 300 feet, we, stay charging, we start taking a GPS pin every second. So as you get closer to that virtual fence line, you're taking a whole bunch more pins and that GPS is working a whole lot harder. So your accuracy gets tighter because we have more sampling data. So still maybe like 20 feet accuracy. So that's why that virtual fence line pressure zone is kind of fuzzy on the edge there. And as you get tighter, you're a greater percentage of time in those areas where the GPS is working harder. So it's not necessarily the sound and the shock that's draining the battery. It's really how hard that GPS is working based on how close it is to virtual fence lines as a percentage of the time. And then as far as base station go, we, we're trying to stick to a two base station minimum this year, just because our experience over the past year has shown that the folks that go with one base station, because generally what we say is, hey, we recommend four base stations. And then folks go, all right, well, I want 500 callers and I only want to buy one base station. <laughs> so we found when that happens, and we, we said yes to that a lot last year. We said, hey, we want to make it work. Let's see how it goes. We want to get callers out in the field. One base station just leads to a poor user experience. You have less coverage across the ranch. There's more dead zones, less robust sort of network. So the producer ends up getting less feedback in the software. So you get less location data showing you where the animals are at. And then when you go to send new instructions to those callers, it takes a lot longer. So the system is less adaptable. You know, you get less feedback. So it doesn't, it's, it's not as quick to react. And what we found is the folks that have a robust network and have good coverage, they have a whole lot better experience and they're a whole lot happier than the folks that have tried to skimp on the number of base stations. So part of our thing over the next year is we have a lot of interest, a ton of interest. We don't necessarily need to sell a certain number of callers, we're very manageable, the number we need to sell. So we're very focused on choosing the right partners. And part of that is setting people up for success because we'd much rather have someone that does a good job and buys 500 callers and they're really happy over the next year, then have someone buy 5,000 callers, then it just blows up and they do a, and they have a terrible experience and they go tell their friends it sucked, right? So part of that is, is we have two base stations because it leads to a better user experience. That's what we're trying to stick to. I have a question about the callers. Or so yes. um when I when Donnie and I heard uh the presentation, I think it was, it must've been in like maybe August of last year. Um, have you guys changed that? Cause at that time, I think he was talking about you rent the callers. How does that work? Yeah, so the callers on the subscription model. So this one right here is version 2.5. And then there's actually Rev A, Rev B, Rev C, Rev D, all these different versions of the caller that are coming out with slight modifications. For example, this battery door has a gore vent, which is like gore tex like your coat, allows humidity out, prevents moisture from getting in. In some situations, it was a small percentage of time, it was letting too much water in. So you remove that gore vent. On the corner here, there would be mud and stuff that would get taped inside this. So we, and it would short out the collar. So we changed the attachment style. So things that aren't, that, it's not like a totally new version of the collar. There's not new electronics, but there's small changes that are occurring. And whenever you need a new collar or your collar reaches the end of its expected lifespan, which is hopefully two to three years, probably not quite there yet, but you know, it, it's like your cell phone. You don't get the iPhone 16 as soon as it comes out, but as soon as your iPhone breaks or as soon as your iPhone reaches the end of its two year expected lifespan, then you just get whatever the newest and greatest is. Same thing with the collars. The subscription model is nice because you play that flat, flat 40 bucks per year. And then when you get new callers, you get whatever the latest off the inventory line is. And then we'll, we'll have another version of the caller, like a new guts, new electronics, total redesign, a couple of years down the road, probably. And then in those situations, same sort of thing. You, the plan now is you don't have to pay an upgrade fee or anything like that. When you're ready for your new callers, you get whatever the newest is. And then they all are backward compatible. So they'll work with all the base stations and nothing will ever change on the network side. Okay, thank you. Absolutely.
Any other questions out there? The way you're talking about that design working, that really isn't going to work very well for really dense uh, herds of critters. Correct. As far, I mean, as, as, far as like the the way the GPS talks to the talks back to the or the caller. Are you referring, Pete, like to like a high stock density situation? Is that what you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, I was just thinking about you know, uh, you know, you mentioned on there about how. Uh, the battery drain is worse in, in those rotational systems, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about the way you were talking about that. I was like, God, that would be, if you're doing once a day moves, especially in the Eastern part of the country, like you were talking, that would drain that really, really fast. Cause you'd yeah. be so close in all the time. Are you guys working on something to try to make that work? Yeah, absolutely. This, this is that, the, the totally version of the call there. Like first commercial year so we, we know we're limited in certain aspects it's a novel technology and being able to do super high intensity rotational grazing is one of the things that we're limited at right now you know we're 20 30 acres moving cows every couple of days we can do that it takes a hit on the battery life but when we're super tight just just a limiting factor in the collar right now i think as the technology continues to advance we'll see improvements there because that's certainly the direction that we want to go in ultimately um, right now, we understand, you know, a lot of folks do that. We try to be upfront that may be a little disappointed if you try and use the collar for that right now. So hopefully in the future, that'll continue to improve. And we certainly want the collar to be able to do that. So just part of working on new technology. I was telling John before everybody jumped on here that um, Rusty Tessier from Belfield uh, had invited us to come over and listen to a similar presentation. And uh, he's looking at it from a standpoint that he has 60 or 70 miles to drive to this pasture um, to check cattle, check water, move cattle. Um, and if he could minimize that by utilizing a system like this. And I think they had worked that out to, I think it was a two, two station or two tower um, system. And I was actually shocked, to be honest with you, because I had been on the pastures and I was like, Hmm, it'll be interesting to see how many towers they think he's going to need, but it, it was amazing the coverage that there was on it. So. Yeah, we can do 10,000 acres to 30,000 acres pretty easily per base station it really just depends on topography. It's all going to be unique and specific to the individual ranch. Yeah. Like this was, I, I want to say it was like two sections. I think that he was dealing with over there, um, like 1200 and some acres or something. Um, but yeah, I just, it was a, a neat tool to, to be able to have available to him in that situation. So yeah, a lot of folks really like the location data. Uh, I, I have lunch with folks when I'm driving around and going through saliva here in Colorado, we've got a big project there. And uh, I see Bryce Lewis, he pulls out his phone to show me a picture. And the first thing that he has open is his cows on his iPhone. So a lot of people get pretty excited about the location data. And again, it's a, we want to be a tool for the producer's toolkit. There's a lot of different use cases and values that you can derive from it. And we, we don't want to tell anyone what to do with the collars or how to do it. Um, we'll teach you how to use the collar and the software and how to put it on and make sure it's effective. But as far as how you utilize the tool thereafter, uh, we're more than happy to to see all sorts of different use cases. Can you talk a little bit about the tendencies of the different species that you've collared as far as their response to the beeping, the uh, shock? Yeah, yeah. So, so I can, I can uh, talk about two basically. So the, the bison, we only have 50 collars on bison and a nature conservancy property in Southern Colorado. Again, very much a, a pilot program. We just had an opportunity to do so. So we figured we would not commercially available by any means or anything like that. But the folks down there, they, they know the veterinarian for the Turners who have a bunch of bison. And the vet said that he thought the collars were actually going to work better because the bison bunch up naturally and are pretty skittish as a species. So we we put the collars on and think the training went really well and the animals responded really well to the to the stimulus. Uh, I don't have the specifics because I wasn't the one handling the software down there, but everything that I've heard is it went really well. And then as far as training goes for cows, it's a period of four to seven days. We like to see 50 to 100 acres of hard fence line. We have base station coverage, collars on, and then you layer on a shock zone 
along a hard fence line so the animals have the physical cue. Then you layer on a sound zone along with that shock zone, again, with the physical cue, so they start to associate those. And then you graduate kindergarten, which is subdividing that existing pasture to see if the animals respect the virtual fence line. And CS on the customer success team says that it takes four to seven to tra days to train the animals, and it takes a month to train the producers. So the animals pick it up pretty quickly. And then the software, sometimes it happens really, really quickly. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but they're there to help you along the way. I know uh, there was a gal that jumped on uh, with us when we were at this meeting in, in Dickinson last fall. And <laughs> she told a story about a lady that the system had been sold to. And, you know, they had told her, you know, you need to kind of do like a three to five day training with your livestock and get them acclimated to it, similar to livestock that hadn't been around an electric fence before. And supposedly she must have just literally opened the gate, turned them out. But she, it was amazing. They said she really never had problems with it, but it about made the two of them crawl out of their skin when she told them that. That's funny. Yeah, we've had folks that have run out of time and they've just turned out to the forest service and trained them up on the mountain and it works. It's just, you won't, there's a learning curve for the animals and you'll be able to do more progressive stuff and you'll have a higher effective rate if you take the time to train those animals. And then year over year, it basically compounds. You don't have to retrain, but the animals start to understand instinctively. And part of it is kind of like the animals trusting the virtual fence lines and realizing that, hey, I'm enclosed here right now, but this virtual fence line is going to drop before I run out of feed or before I run out of water or anything like that. So I might as well just wait. Whereas if they haven't been trained and they don't know that yet, it can be probably more stressful to them potentially, or you know, it can lead to less efficacy. But as long as the longer they're on the system, the better they'll do. I know one question that came up, um, can you talk a little bit about like if the cows, like say it's cow-calf pairs and you have the cows collared and okay. kind of how the interaction, what you see with the calves? Yeah, yeah. So the bond is strong enough that we don't have to put collars on calves. Um, part of the reason is also that we don't have the ability to make changes to the or adjustments to the collar sizing wise as that calf grows, it grows too fast and nobody handles their calves that often. So the bond is strong enough that we're able to effectively virtual fence cow-calf pairs with the only collar in the cows. And we are predominantly on cow-calf operations. We do some yearling and stalkers, but for the majority cow-calf operations. And then you may have a, a cow that gets pulled out by a calf every once in a while, but for the most part, the herd pressure and the draw is strong enough to keep them from wandering too far off, and we have really good efficacy. Cool. Pete, I see you had, had unmuted. Did you have another question? Yeah, I was, well, I was wondering about, I know you mentioned that you were doing some trials on sheep. Are you trying it on guard dogs as well? And no, also no the dogs. trials on sheep. Yeah, How's that going? A, just a sheep uh, trial in Australia, actually. It's part of a, a cow trial as well. And then we had the opportunity to do it. So we figured we might as well, but no commercial operations going on for sheep or any other species right now. But we sure get a lot of folks ask if we can put collars on wolves, especially here in Colorado <laughs> these days. But the answer, unfortunately, is no. It's just everything from an engineering perspective and from a commercial perspective is on gas for the next foreseeable future. Another question for you, John, as far as the yearlings go, what have you seen for effectiveness on yearlings versus cows? I mean, we all know that the cows are much more laid back in most instances um, is, do you have to adjust that, uh, that noise zone to a larger area with yearlings just because they move faster or, or is it pretty similar situation? That's a good question. We're looking to get more data on yearlings this year. We've, we've certainly collared yearlings and Todd from our engineering side, product side has said that they're kind of like teenagers. They're a little bit more unruly from, an, from a virtual fencing perspective, but we've had good efficacy. I can't give any specifics on like retention or anything like, or excuse me, efficacy in terms of virtual fencing retention or anything like that. I'm trying to think of some good examples. Um, but one thing that we, we do say if folks are going to collar yearlings, we're pretty careful about the fit. So you can leave the collar a little bit looser for a swing. 
but we absolutely recommend that you go and check those collars. I think it's maybe 30 or 40 days after you put those on just to make sure that the, the, the fit isn't getting too tight because some of those animals will grow a little faster than others. And generally we're, we're okay, but we certainly want to get a visual ID on those animals and make sure that they're not growing too fast with a collar. And you can put it on with a decent amount of swing. We do a fit test where you pull the chain and it should be able to reach one ear on the animal. We should be able to get it over the crown of the skull or anything like that. So if you leave it on the looser side, it certainly leaves some room for growth. Uh, and that's one of the things that we'd want to take into account when we're doing earlings. And you can adjust those widths for the sound zone, the shock zone. So the customer success folks do help folks change those from now and then. And again, very specific to use case, very specific to the animals you're working with and the topography and all that. Okay, thanks on that. And um, the other question I had was pertaining to base stations. And uh, with most of your experience being in Colorado, I'm I'm gonna assume a lot of it was mountainous terrain. Um, I guess I can only speak for myself. This area that I'm part of, uh, we're talking across, well, the, the largest section I run on is about 2,700 acres. So mm -hmm. not very large and I'm, I'm a fragmented um, ranch, but that 2,700 acres we're talking 200 feet of elevation change, maybe 300 at the most. Um, and I would say that's pretty standard for central North Dakota. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about these acreage amounts, um, do you have any idea of the elevation swings that play into that as well? Just, just for context for us. Yeah, absolutely. So we do a ton of work in the mountains in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, but we also have a bunch of projects on the plains in Colorado, which are super flat. And then I was just in Kansas last week in the Gypsum Hills. So definitely topography there. I would say around there, probably pretty a few hundred feet, something like that, maybe 500 feet on some of those big draws and gullies that they have. Nothing not crazy like it is up in the mountains in Colorado. And we run the RF plan again, very specific to the individual location and elevation advantage certainly helps us. We get more bang for our buck when we have a big peak or a big butte to put the base station up on top of, but we go down way South flat Texas to you by the coast where it's literally just as flat as you can see. And I look at it on Google earth and I spin around and there's literally no topography change. And in those situations, you can do about 10,000 acres per base station with good coverage too. Uh, it just depends kind of sometimes the, the train is like sloping down this way or sometimes there's like a, a valley and draw. So it, it really all depends on what the specific terrain looks like. But for 2,700 acres, my kind of off the cuff would be one to two base stations would give you really good coverage. And we probably want two because there'd be some dead zones on the other sides of the draws and whatnot. And again, you get better coverage and better user experience with the, with the better network. Do you have to put up um, protection around those base stations, I would assume? We like to see people put mesh wire panels around them, particularly if there's going to be wildlife coming through because they can rub on the guy wires and we don't want them taking anything down or messing anything up. So we do recommend that. We also have them in areas that aren't trafficked and we leave them and they, they seem to be fine. Okay, thank you. I muted myself so you didn't have to listen to my phone ringing. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from anybody? You can type them in the chat as well. I forgot to mention that earlier. Okay. Um, well, if you have one yet, uh, you're not completely out of time, but um, I will just kind of uh, mention about next week again. So if there was some of you that weren't on right away, uh, next week on April 27th, we have Jay Fear uh, coming on with us. He is going to be talking about cover crops, uh, moving the carbon dial. And that will be our last munch on this for 
uh, this series anyway. And then um, I do also want to mention that we're working on a series of holistic management videos. Uh, there will be four of 40 of them. We're going to release those in a series, uh, probably like one a week. We don't have a release date for the first one yet. We have one that we need to edit yet before we get to that stage, but we're super excited about that. There's a lot of information coming out from grazing systems to winter grazing, to cover crops, to water developments, uh, holistic goals, succession planning. It kind of covers a, a wide array of topics. So uh, be on the lookout for those. They will be shared on our YouTube channel. Uh, and then we'll also be sharing those on our Facebook page um, each week. So um, I'm going to give one last chance for questions. Okay. Well, um, John, I would like to thank you for joining us. Uh, the uh, information is, is very useful. And I think like we were talking before we got started this evening, I, I just think it's a, it's a nice tool to have in a toolbox if it works in your operation. And I think the potential is, is amazing for where you can go with this. And, you know, like you said, right now, maybe it doesn't work the greatest in a 30 acre pasture, but down the road, you know, there's, uh, I think the, the potential for that to happen at some point in time. So uh, thank you for, for presenting and being with us this evening. Thank you so much. Appreciate you having me. We'll see you guys. Yes. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a good night.